when the occasion arose to exhibit some violence, it came naturally. She didn't think twice and she did it. He was really considered a monster. If you looked at him the wrong way, he would do something very, very bad to you. That is one thing that those people had in common, this ability to incite fear in people because people do not know just how far they're prepared to go. This is the story of John Frederick Chow Hayes, Australia's first gangster. And Matilda Tilly Devine, Sydney's first lady of vice. Two of the most terrifying crime figures of the 20th century and veterans of the infamous Razor Gang Wars of the 1920s. By the time they died, mourned by few, they'd each racked up more than 80 criminal convictions. In this episode of Suburban Gangsters, we explore the life, times and crimes of Tilly Devine and Chow Hayes. With hair trigger tempers, they slashed, bashed and shot their way to notoriety, striking fear into the hearts of enemies and allies alike. They lived in an age when gambling, prostitution and alcohol were commodities controlled and ruthlessly run by the underworld. This was the perfect environment for two ferocious and enterprising characters to make their marks. He was a brutal double murderer and standover man. She was a prostitute who clawed her way up from the streets to become the queen of the underworld. Time seems to be kind to criminals. Over the years, they become colourful characters, but in fact, Tilly Devine was nothing more than a calculating, sociopathic, evil individual. Matilda Mary Twiss was born into poverty in the London slum of Camberwell in 1900. Growing up in squalor, she and her family lived on the edge of starvation and penury. So to survive, young women like Tilly were forced to sell the only thing they had their bodies. For Tilly, it was the whorehouse or the factory, and there was little dignity to be found in either. People were prepared to do whatever it took to get out of the, the grinding poverty and, and hopelessness. And you have to remember that the options for women in Edwardian England, working class women, were very limited. It's hard to imagine how ghastly life would have been growing up in the slums of London pre and during the First World War. It would be almost Dickensian. So she had a, a very, very sad childhood. In fact, she had no childhood at all. She was already engaging in prostitution at the age of 14 and probably earlier. As a child prostitute, Tilly soon learnt that London's wealthy gentlemen, so dignified in their frock coats and top hats, had the greatest appetite for her wares. There was a very strong class dimension to prostitution in Victorian and Edwardian England. It's very clear that a lot of the men who um, sought the services of women for commercial sex were middle and upper class men. But there was a particular cachet about particularly young girls and they were very much sought after by uh, men of all classes, but particularly, I think, men of, of the upper classes, who were prepared to pay large sums of money um, to get young girls. It's a terrible life. It's a terrible life. She would have exposed to terrible exploitation. Violence is part and parcel of that working culture. It's not like it's, you know, some boudoir somewhere. It's a pretty terrible culture, and you get exposed to a lot of awful things. 
Survival was a daily test of character and resolve. If someone got over Tilly, she was finished. So she learnt to stand her ground and never stepped away from a street fight in her whole life. When World War I broke out in 1914, London was flooded with soldiers. Among them, bronzed Aussie diggers ready to fight the Kaiser. Servicemen making their way to or returning from the horrors of the front sought comfort in the arms of prostitutes. For girls like Tilly, these men were a lucrative meal ticket. For young girls like Matilda Twiss, Australian soldiers were a prime target because they were very, very well paid. Unlike British servicemen, they, had, they were earning almost double the money that a, than a Tommy Atkins soldier was earning. One of Tilly's targets was a strong, tall digger of dubious character named Big Jim Devine. Jim Devine was an appalling individual. He was violent, he was brutal, he was foul-mouthed, whether he was drunk or whether he was sober. He was the antithesis of the popular idea of, of the bronzed Anzac. He was anything but that. He was a malingerer. He spent most of his time, you know, either on the run or uh, in the hands of the military police. Perhaps Tilly saw her own reflection in his dark nature, but something about this sullen, black-tempered man captured her heart and the two were quickly married. He was 24, she, a not-so-sweet 16. I'm not surprised that Tilly was attracted to Jim, not just because it was useful to have um, a strong man to look after you, but also because it offered some possibility of a real escape from a life that I don't imagine had a lot of um, attractions in, in England during and after the First World War. Tilly no doubt saw in Jim a brighter future for herself. A year later, she left post-war London and followed her husband to a land of opportunity and a fresh start. She expected that Australia was a new land, new hope. She wasn't going to go to the um, world of prostitution that she'd left behind in London. Unfortunately for Tilly, she'd married Big Jim Devine. He'd come back to Sydney, established himself as a standover man. And his plan for her was that she was going straight back into the world of prostitution. This is a, an appalling situation for, for any marriage to start, and of course it led to much worse things. He was particularly violent with, uh, with Tilly, as he was with uh, virtually everyone he crossed paths with. Tilly was soon back on the game, working the red light haunts of Palmer, Burke, Forbes and Riley streets in Darlinghurst and East Sydney. She charged top price and always collected. Any client foolish enough not to pay faced the fury of Big Jim's fists. Tilly always grew up in an atmosphere of violence. Uh, and her experiences with Jim just intensified um, her appreciation for the value of violence and her skill at using it. Between 1921 and 1925, Tilly accumulated 79 arrests for prostitution, obscene language, offensive behaviour and fighting. She quickly learned that you had to be as tough as the men in Sydney and this was extraordinary for that era because there were very few women who did anything other than what they were told in those days and became equally as feared as any of the men because she was fearless in as much as she would do whatever it took and she was violent. She was sentenced to two years in Long Bay Jail for slashing an enemy's face with a razor while he sat in a barber's chair. <laughs> 
woman, this small woman, would come in with a razor and actually do it herself. That's, that's another level. I mean, we're, we're talking about the mid-1920s here. I mean, women were not allowed in pubs. Um, you know, they had to sit outside or sit in the parlour or whatever. And then to have this woman just arrive on the scene and she was taking no truck from anyone. She was out there with a razor in her hand and she, she was out there to go and hurt someone. That was unthinkable at that time. Tilly's time in prison was the perfect finishing school for the 25-year-old. When she emerged two years later, she planned to put herself at the top of Sydney's underworld. While Tilly Devine was doing time in jail for slashing a man's face to ribbons with a razor, a young lad by the name of John Frederick Hayes was earning himself an equally bad reputation for violence. I would say scores, possibly hundreds of times, he would have been involved in fights. It was his currency. Hayes was born in Glebe, a rough working-class suburb of Sydney in 1911. He was the illegitimate son of a prostitute called Elizabeth Hayes. Any chance to get to know his father quickly evaporated when the boy was three. His father left to fight in the Great War. The First World War was like a giant wrecking ball through the male population of Australia, and particularly the cities. And it left a generation with a very uh, disturbed or totally absent mentor generation. So Hayes, in fact, grew up with his father never being there and then dying, a grandfather briefly being there when he was very young and then dying, and so being in a household only with females. He had no male father figure. And he realised from when he was about eight or nine years old that, in fact, the women in his life were not going to assert any authority over him. He started roaming the streets and, and skipping school. Hayes' life from his earliest days was steeped in violence. During one fight, a boy called him a dirty chow, thinking that Hayes was of Asian descent. The racist nickname stuck. He learned to fight on the streets, and by 11, he was part of a gang battling other louts and orphans for turf. Sydney in those days, inner Sydney, the working class suburbs, was divided into half a dozen tough gangs. And these kids basically roamed the streets wild. A lot of them, their fathers had either been killed or injured in the war. There was no father figure controlling them. Chow and his cronies hung out at Railway Square, which was really the gateway to Sydney, probably the busiest part of Sydney. Here they would bash and rob new arrivals. It was also a launching point for shoplifting raids on the city's department stores. Those gangs were the breeding ground for the criminals. And in fact, what happened to Hayes was he found himself at age 14 after half a dozen convictions for shoplifting, being sent to Gosford Boys Home. And Gosford Boys Home, as he said, was where he met, at age 14 and a half, murderers. It was the classic case of the university for criminals and it absolutely set Hayes on a course, as far as he was concerned, where he learned everything by the time he was 17 about being a criminal. By 18, Chow had 14 charges to his name, including demanding money by menace and assault. He was well on his way to becoming Sydney's most terrifying standover man. But even a hard man like Chow had a weakness and her name was Topsy. She was his childhood sweetheart, and the two tied the knot in 1932. 
she was a nurse and was never really fully aware of what he was up to. Which was an incredible thing because as Sydney's probably most notorious gangster, it must have been pretty hard to keep it hidden from his own wife. Normally, marriage and the birth of his first child mellows a man, but not Chow. At 22, he was just getting started. The worlds inhabited by the prostitute Tilly Devine and standover man Chow Hayes were soon to overlap. Well, I guess one of the main weapons in the armoury of any extortionist or standover man is a reputation for violence. One thing that Hayes had in common with Tilly Devine was this propensity to explode into sudden rage. People knew that about them and therefore trod very carefully. Sydney, New South Wales. Today, this glistening harbour city is on the travel itineraries of millions of tourists. The suburbs of Darlinghurst, Woolloomooloo and Surrey Hills have been gentrified and bear only the faintest scars of their sordid past. But almost a century ago, these were slums controlled by rival gangs that competed for illicit incomes. Off course racetrack betting and prostitution were illegal. And there was a law that public bars had to close at 6 p.m. So organized crime gangs satisfied the demand for girls, sly grog and a punt. Tilly and Big Jim Devine both got out of prison around the same time. Jim had been inside for acting as a pimp. This had given Tilly an idea. What Tilly learnt from her experience of exploitation was that she didn't want to be exploited again. Uh, if there was going to be any exploiting, she was going to be doing it. At the time, it was illegal for men to live off the earnings of prostitutes or to run brothels. But the law made no mention of women. Tilly takes advantage of this extraordinary loophole. There always seemed to be these loopholes with, with governments around Australia in those days. But this one was that it was illegal for a male pimp, if you like, to run a bordello. But it was OK for a woman to run a brothel. And so she did. While Tilly opened a string of brothels in Woolloomooloo, Kings Cross and Darlinghurst, police and politicians were desperately trying to clean up the town. There's a lot of petty assault. There were a lot of returned soldiers themselves, young men who were addicted to drugs, particularly cocaine and morphine, which had begun in military hospitals but was continued in civilian life. Cocaine, once legally sold through pharmacies, was now outlawed and heavy penalties for the possession of handguns were enacted. So what the criminals did was they got rid of the guns and they replaced them with cutthroat razors, shaving razors in those days. And these razors were used not only as a very effective weapon in separating somebody from their money in a hold-up, they became symbolic. They became known as the razor gangs for that reason. Criminals walking around Sydney with a ubiquitous scar that went vertically down the left-hand side of their face and across their mouth was some sort of badge of honour for these people. Tilly's great rival was a ruthless bootlegger named Kate Lee. She'd built an empire selling grog to drinkers after closing time. Smart and opportunistic, Kate quickly added cocaine to her menu and watched her profits grow. A few suburbs away, Tilly and Jim Devine were quick to tap this new revenue stream. 
Tilly was running her crime empire as a kind of one-stop shop. Uh, you know, girls were selling cocaine, girls were taking cocaine. Sometimes they were paid, and probably more often than not, in cocaine. So it became this vicious cycle for these girls working on the prostitution game. Instead of being paid, they became addicted to cocaine, and it was a very cruel and manipulative thing to do. Inevitably, a battle for supremacy broke out between Tilly and her rival. This extraordinary situation arose where Tilly had a, a rival, another female rival in Sydney, in Kate Lee, and she was every bit as horrible as Tilly Devine. And, and this war erupted between, uh, between these two matriarchs of, of Sydney crime, if you like, and, and it was a violent war. Their fierce rivalry drove each of them to try and outdo the other. As far as I know, it's the only time in criminal history when such a situation has arisen. And they succeeded because they were more ruthless, more powerful, smarter than the men who were buying for them. Tilly and Kate employed violent thugs and standover men to protect their empires. They were called the Razor Gangs, and when they met in the streets, there was bloodshed. That just became worse and worse, and degenerating into these, these enormous street fights with people wielding razors and belting each other to death. There was a, a major riot in August 1929 in Kellett Street in King's Cross, and something like 40, 50 gangsters going at each other with, um, with razors. One of Kate's men involved in that affray was Chow Hayes. He was a formidable fighter with a burning ambition to be Sydney's toughest thug. At the age of 23, with a string of arrests behind him, he achieved his goal and became Australia's first recognised gangster. It was a term recently coined for America's notorious criminal Al Capone, but had never been used in Australia. A major criminal in Sydney of the day was a guy named Frank Green. Frank, the little gunman Green, was the most feared member of Tilly's razor gang. As his name suggested, he didn't confine himself to razors. Hayes sees him at a party, Green comes up to Hayes and says, you were eyeing off my woman. And Hayes said, no, I wasn't. And he said, yes, you were, and I don't like it. Hayes leaves the party soon after, and he knows Green's reputation. But he decides that he's going to do something about this. Hayes calls out to him, hey, Frank. And Green turns around and says, what do you want? And Hayes says, I've got a present for you. Immediately whacks him with the metal pipe across the head, such that Green is actually in hospital for the next four weeks. This incident is plastered over the front of the afternoon papers in Sydney that Frank Green, one of the most feared standover men in Sydney, has been bashed. And here's the new guy to be feared in Sydney, Chow Hayes. New South Wales enacted a new law designed to bring an end to the razor gangs. It was now illegal for known criminals to associate with each other. The law may have brought the razor gangs to heel, but for the likes of Tilly and Chow, there would always be a new war to fight. From the time she first met Jim during the First World War, attaching herself to him just dragged her into a particularly violent life. She saw her own husband bash this bloke, the big Jim Devine with his great big fists, bash this bloke to the ground and then murder him with a cutthroat razor. So she was becoming seasoned to seeing these terribly violent things. Tilly was no stranger to violence or hard times. The tough London prostitute managed to weather Jim's abuse and the financial storm of the Great Depression. 
The depression of the 1930s in Australia was very severe. A third of the workforce were unemployed and in some areas, um, particularly working class areas, that figure you know, could reach 50%. So that affected families, it affected women as well as men. Economic hardship was good for Tilly's business and she readily exploited desperate women. While families starved, she shamelessly flaunted her wealth. Her fingers were dripping in diamonds. She used the elegant jewellery like knuckle dusters on those foolish enough to cross her. There was one documented um, occasion where she, she beat a girl repeatedly on the face with her fist, which was covered in diamond rings and lacerated her quite badly. She slashed other girls who worked for her. She was terrifying. She was so wealthy, she could have retired at age 30, 31 without, without too many problems. But she kept throwing herself back into the fray. Tilly's empire, built on prostitution, cocaine and stealing from clients, boomed with the outbreak of World War II. The outbreak of World War II signified the end of the Great Depression. So all of a sudden, the economy had a, a massive boost. There was money about, and Sydney was again awash with soldiers. She had brothels opening up, and she had girls working around the clock. And what she tried to do was gain some kind of respectability rather than notoriety. And I guess this came from her childhood. Growing up in the slums and wanting some kind of recognition and some standing in society that had a sort of cornerstone of respectability about her. Sydney was a place where a rapid social ascent was possible. The one-time street prostitute was a regular in the social pages, which reported on the extravagant parties she held at her beachside home. So this facade of her being this wonderful socialite was completely incongruous with what was going on with the rest of her life. So she'd have these lavish parties from her home and socialites and actors and whomever else would be there. But meanwhile, she has all these brothels working and these girls working around the clock and this cocaine and sly grog and payoffs to the coppers. And, and Tilly would, was now, she was sort of posturing, walking around in, in you know, high society, dripping with jewellery. But then she'd think nothing about, you know, giving somebody a diamond ring straight across the forehead. It, it just a truly awful individual. Only Big Jim's appetite for violence was greater than hers. Things start changing at their own anniversary party out at Torrington Road, Maroubra, when at the end of festivities, a drunken Jim clouts Tilly. Now, this is nothing new. They've been doing it ever since they met. But it's public. The humiliation of it is something that Tilly seems not willing to cop. The end of the relationship for Tilly Devine and, and Big Jim Devine comes in 1948. She finds Big Jim in bed with another woman and this is the end. She basically tells Jim to get out. He leaves the house and mysteriously, two days later, he is suddenly attacked in the street and slashed with a razor, and everybody knows who arranged it. Decades of abuse came to an end when she filed for divorce. Big Jim faded into the history of Sydney's underworld, and his ex-wife Tilly continued on without him. By the age of 28, Frederick John Chow Hayes had racked up 70 convictions. Theft, resisting arrest, demanding money with menaces, riotous behaviour, armed robbery occasioning bodily harm, and soon, murder. Chow Hayes has an unbelievable criminal record. 
court where there's dozens of appearances in court and he in fact ends up in and out of jail, in for six months, out for six months, in for three months, out for three months. Jail, in Chow's opinion, was merely an occupational hazard. All he cared about was as soon as he was out of jail, you had to quickly re-establish that you were the toughest guy in Sydney, your reputation relied on that so that you could automatically collect the standover without having to do much about it. If you didn't, there would be other young up-and-comers who, who would want to establish their reputation as the toughest man in Sydney, and he wasn't going to let that happen no matter what. Chow Hayes would graduate from thug to murderer with the killing of Bobby Lee in 1951. Lee was a boxer who'd come to blows with a member of Hayes's gang. Lee knew that Chow would retaliate, so he decided to get in first. He went to Chow's home and, in a case of mistaken identity, shot and killed Hayes's nephew, Danny Simmons. Bobby Lee disappeared into hiding and Chow burned for revenge. Not long after, Chow got wind that Lee was going to be at the Ziegfeld Club, a seedy dive in Sydney's King Street. And this was Chow's opportunity to go down there and get back at him for the shooting of Danny Simmons. And um, he made a fatal mistake by telling his wife that he was going to the Ziegfeld room. And she said, I love to go dancing. And of course, he wasn't in a position to say, well, actually, I'm not going there to dance. I'm going down there to shoot somebody. So he goes to the Ziegfeld club. And of course, here's Bobby Lee sitting there with a, a bunch of people, women all around him. And Chow comes up to him and he says something like, you know, well, you know, you're not going to do anything to me. We're sitting in a room full of people. And Chow just gets his gun out and says something like, you're going to fucking get yours. In front of his wife, Topsy, and 350 witnesses, Chow shot Lee at close range. By the time the police arrived, there were only about 80 people. And those 80 people were either visited by Chow or just through weight of reputation. None of them actually saw anything that happened and they couldn't find who actually pulled the trigger and killed Bobby Lee. Chow sauntered through two mistrials before policeman Ray Gunner Kelly found his Achilles heel. Kelly said to Hayes, he said, well, look, he said, your wife was there. We're going to charge her with, with being an accessory. Chow, and probably one of his very few acts of chivalry, actually put his hand up uh, for, for the killing, and uh, subsequently he was sentenced to hang. In 1945, Tilly was at the peak of her power. She had navigated her way through prison, the razor wars, decades of domestic violence, and had grown rich through the Great Depression and Second World War. On May 19, her life seemed complete when she tied the knot with her new love, Eric Parsons. He was a criminal, but a gentle, subservient type. And Tilly, of course, who has all the not notoriety, all the publicity, all the power and all the money at this stage, basically rules the roost in that relationship, but she's still gone back into the criminal milieu to find her next partner. In an ironic twist to this tale, Tilly, once the battered wife, turned into the oppressor, as her nephew, Dr George Parsons, explains. And there's a couple of legends about him. If he was dancing too close to somebody, she'd uh, sort of... <laughs> deal with him. There is one legend, I don't know whether it's true, that 
that she once shot, um, shot him in the in the knee on the wedding night when they were because he, he was dancing a bit close to somebody. Uh, um, so it was a nice bloke and uh, very understanding, uh, getting shot out the way he did. Tilly had transformed herself into tabloid royalty. She was known as the Queen of Woolloomooloo. In 1953, the press reported she'd spent a small fortune on a trip back to the mother country for the coronation of Elizabeth II. She thought it was big time. It was her, she'd come home and she'd come home now in glory. She was there at the, the big event. Um, she was no longer the, you know, the, the harlot from the streets. Tilly's final comeuppance, of course, gets great headlines when she returns from the royal coronation and she finds the taxation department is on to her. They have monitored all the spending that Tilly is supposed to have done both overseas and in Sydney. Decades of tax evasion had finally caught up with her. She made it known fairly generally that she'd spent 20,000 pounds on this trip back to England. And then strangely enough, the tax department gave her a bill for a precisely £20,000. £20,000 in the 1950s is a huge amount of money. That's more than the value of even quite a nice suburban house. Hard money to raise in a hurry, and if she doesn't get it, it's a jail sentence for her. She managed to scrape up the money for the tax man, but her crown was starting to slip. So this monumental tax bill, together with you know, new blood, new bad blood coming through Sydney's underworld, was really starting to put Tilly out of business. She was a figure uh, from the 1920s and 30s, and in the 50s, she really started to show her age and, and her empire was starting to crumble. She outlived her old nemesis, Kate Lee, but Tilly, battle-scarred and exhausted, faced a fresh wave of enemies. The sad end to Tilly's life is that if you look at the criminal records, even in her last years, there are a series of incidents where she ends up in confrontations, either attempting to glass someone, pulling out a gun and threatening them, or indeed just physical violence, and this is a woman who now is well past her prime, but still, without thinking, immediately resorts to physical violence whenever her temper triggers off. She's tiny. She looks much older than her 60-odd um, years. While she was still trying to run her brothels, she simply didn't have the strength or the motivation or the ruthlessness anymore and was easy pickings for the likes of Joe Borg and younger people who came in and took over her area. She was around to see herself forgotten and worse than forgotten, perhaps just rendered unimportant or irrelevant. In 1970, after a long illness, Tilly's life came to an end. By then, she was a forgotten relic. Her obituary summed her up accurately and without pity, as a vicious, grasping, high priestess of savagery, venery, obscenity and whoredom. Chow Hayes, Australia's first gangster, would soon suffer the same humiliation and simply fade into oblivion. He had been sentenced to hang for the 1951 murder of boxer Bobby Lee, but escaped the hangman's noose when capital punishment was abolished in 1955. When Hayes is eventually released from jail in the 1970s, the world has changed. It's two decades later. 
the criminal background that Hayes relied on had largely changed and now it was the drug trade. Most of the people that he knew had either died or had grown old and disappeared. He found himself almost with nothing to do and no one to stand over. Chow was not content to fade into obscurity and approached a Sydney journalist, David Hickey, to tell his story. He was interested still, as an old man, in making sure that his reputation was as the feared man. And in some ways, the appeal of the celebrity criminal was there for him, and he resented the fact that there were all these, while he'd been away, new criminals had come along who got all the front pages of the newspapers, and um, everyone had forgotten about him. Hayes returned briefly to the media spotlight when the book was published in 1990. He was a man who, who would walk in, he would sit behind the radio microphone, he would be asked the first question. Without blinking an eye, he would give the details of how he brutally murdered someone, how he shot someone, what he thought about that. And every interviewer, without exception, would almost recoil in horror. And do you feel any remorse for it now? No. Does that strike you as odd? Not really, no. It's either me or them. Those tough days and we get to go with the tough. Well, it wasn't really either you or them. You could have walked away from most of that. Oh, yes, could have walked away, but you'd have lost face if you could have walked away. Do you reckon you should have hanged? Yes. Yeah. Chow's craggy face and cold reptilian eyes caught the attention of artist Bill Leake. I really wanted to paint Chow Hayes because a painting done in from life gives the viewer an opportunity to know what it was like to share the same space with that person, breathe the same air. And so I became convinced that I had an historical responsibility to paint this bloke. There was a sense of urgency in the endeavour. The old gangster was dying of cancer, so Bill Leake set about immortalising Chow in oil paint. He was in such a terrible state. You know, he had an oxygen mask on, which he kept moving aside and and he was coughing up um, shards of his lungs, I think. I couldn't tell what it was, but it didn't look too good to me. And I, uh, I passed on regards from David Hickey, because I told David that I was going out there to see him the next day or something. And he just said, don't talk to me about Hickey. And I said, why? He said, because he robbed me. He honestly believed that the book that, had, that David wrote about him was going to be an international bestseller, you know, there'd be some, uh, there'd be some Hollywood star playing the part of him in the movie and all that sort of thing. And I think he, be, he seriously believed that um, David was squirrelling away millions, you know, and Chow wasn't seeing any of it. And I said, oh, so I said, are you still a bit dirty on him, eh, Chow? He said, dirty. He said, Bill, I'm going to shoot him. And I said, I don't think you're in a fit state to do that, mate. And he said, if I have to crawl in there, I'm going to go into his office at the Sydney Morning Herald and I'll wait outside his door and when he comes out, I'll bloody well shoot him. Chow believed you could measure the worth of a man by the number of people who attended his funeral. When Sydney's once feared standover man died on May 7, 1993, just five mourners stood over his grave. <laughs> 